All right, so uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, my name is Mike Ewall. I'm the founder and executive director of Energy Justice Network. We're a national group based in Philadelphia and uh, we have member groups um, in Delaware County, including the Chester Residence Concern for Quality Living or CIRCLE um, and the Campus Coalition Concerning Chester or C4. Um, plus other groups um, fighting this company, Kavanta, around the region and the country, um, and just folks fighting all sorts of things from gas plants to power plants and um, refineries and all sorts of unwanted um, dirty energy and waste facilities. So largely what we do is support communities um, to protect themselves from these dirty energy and waste industries. Okay. So this is um, just a picture of some of the youth that we were working with several years ago um, in front of Kavanta. Um, this is the largest trash incinerator in the US um, situated in the city of Chester and chesterresonance.org is the website um, for the Chester Residence Concern for Quality Living. And so there's a lot of information you'll find there, a lot more that we're um, constantly adding to there as we migrate. Okay, other I can always see it later. And Justin, I'm gonna put you on mute. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so in this presentation, um, I outlined a number of different frequently asked questions that we've been faced with. And I hope that uh, we'll cover them adequately um, throughout this presentation. But if not, um, feel free to um, drop questions in the chat and I'll do my best to address them as we go. And there are a lot of things um, that are not necessarily covered in here that are covered in other presentations I do that are more pointedly on environmental racism or why trash incinerators are bad. Uh, so some of that is mixed into this presentation, but this is not the thorough, everything you ever need to know about incineration um, presentation. Um, so if you ever want to drill deeper on that, we can do that in the Q&A or in other forums. So how we got here. In 1954, Delaware County created the Delaware County Incinerator Authority. And this is interesting, recently learning that it was first called that. Um, there were three incinerators um, that operated throughout the county, um, which are all now closed. Two of them became the sites of where the two transfer stations that transfer from small trucks to big trucks um, in run by the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority now are located. Now, Part of the story of how we got here is also one of organized crime. Now, this might sound sensationalistic, and so I looked into it. I remember hearing years ago about there being a Pennsylvania Crime Commission, oh. and the stories of Jack McCrelly, who was the mayor of Chester at one time, and was a very powerful political figure, even after he was mayor, um, even after he got out of jail for the corruption that he was involved in, um, still was in a position to basically persuade um, the city to go along with the county's plan to build a new incinerator in the city of Chester. Um, there were actually competing proposals for incinerators, one by the city, one by the county, and the county one is the one that won the day, but it was located in the city, and there were bribes, threats, other very um, unusual and um, unsavory activities that accompanied what went on. And I just recently found that those crime commission reports are online. And so one of them is the one with the most detail is linked um, at the bottom of the slide that you'll get later if you want to dig into the story on that one. So another part of how we got here is just understanding um, the relationship with the landfill that the county owns. And initially I learned that there was an incinerator ash dump that was planned within the county off of Township Line Road. And that was defeated by local opposition. And so what the county did is they bought a landfill in another county. And this is the only time I know of where a county solid waste authority owns a landfill outside of its jurisdiction. Uh, it's very unusual. I can't think of any other example around the country, honestly. And so they ended up buying what used to be called the Colebrookdale Landfill in Berks County. And then the incinerator authority got renamed to the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority. And the landfill got renamed later to the Rolling Hills Landfill, which sounds nice, but um, not so nice if you're living next to it. So the Solid Waste Authority has a long-term contract with Kavanta. Kavanta is the largest trash incinerator company in the US. They 
operate and own this uh, facility in Chester, which is the largest in the country at 3,510 tons per day that they can burn. And the county's contract is what we're currently in a big campaign around right now. That contract has what's called a put or pay clause, which is very dangerous for local governments that want to do the right thing because these contracts basically say that you have to give us a certain amount of trash or pay us anyway. And there are examples like in Claremont, New Hampshire, where 29 towns actually filed for bankruptcy in the 90s with a small trash incinerator because of the put or pay clauses in their contracts that made them have to pay up for services that they weren't even having to use because they didn't need to produce that much waste. So in Delaware County, the contract says 300,000 tons per year is the minimum there's also a, a somewhat <laughs> maximum, um, I'm going to mute you, um, Gene. There's a maximum of 370,000 tons, and they've only crossed that once, and that was in 2020, going 10,000 tons over that limit. And what happens if you go over, you have to pay a normal rate per ton as opposed to the discounted rate that is in the contract. But if you go under the 300,000 tons, in other words, if the county actually got serious about zero waste measures and adopted the measures that we know can reduce waste by way more than 20%, but 20% would put them below that 300,000 and they would have to pay Cavanta to not use them. And then Cavanta can then turn around and if they can find waste from elsewhere, they can get paid twice for the same capacity while the county and municipalities are paying twice, once to do the right thing in reducing waste and once to command to, to not use them. So this is a type of contract that landfills don't have, incinerators have because they need to be fed a certain amount of waste to operate, but it's very um, disadvantageous for anyone that wants to reduce their waste. Now, Alongside this part of the contract is a part that gives Cavanta the right to dump up to 450,000 tons per year of ash in the county's landfill. And they actually brought in um, even more than that from not just the incinerator in Chester, but one in Montgomery County and other incinerators that they operate in New Jersey. Um, they averaged about 451,000 um, tons per year in recent years. Um, so the county is getting a service for less than that, but is guaranteeing and letting its landfill fill up with even more than that tonnage wise, although granted it takes up less space. Um, that is what's going on. And so this ash for cash deal that's basically happening here is that the county is giving very discounted ash dumping rates to Cavanta in exchange for somewhat discounted burning rates at their incinerator. So the contract negotiation that is expected to come up in the next few months is waiting on the state to approve the expansion of the county's landfill. So they have that as a negotiating chip when they offer um, that in exchange for a discounted um, burning rate at Cavanta. Okay, so how this affects Delaware County municipalities. This contract expires on April 30th of next year and the negotiations could start um, probably around late July, early August. Um, it could have started in May, May 1st, according to the contract. Um, that's when the first step is that Cavanta has to tell the authority, hey, we have space, we can do a new contract. As of last week, they have still not even informed the authority that they have space and that they're interested in a new contract. Not sure why they didn't jump on that May 1st, um, but the, the authority is still waiting to hear from Cavanta on that first step of the contract re renewal process. The um, landfill, once it's approved by DEP, the expansion, which latest I heard is expected in late July, um, that's when the negotiations can actually start um, since they're using the landfill as a bargaining chip in this contract negotiation. Now, we learned that the County Solid Waste Authority has been charging $53 a ton to municipalities, but bumped that up $5 a ton at the first day of this year. Uh, that was a pretty big jump. And I learned at the recent authority meeting that there's the possibility that they will be raising the rates again because the cost of this landfill expansion is $50 million just to expand it plus 50 million to do what's called post-closure, to basically close it and take care of it after it's not even operating. 
So the Solid Waste Authority will need $100 million. And to get that, they're looking at raising the rates on those outside of the county that they give away the landfill space to, and likely also um, possibly another $5 per ton increase to municipalities within the county. And we're not sure exactly on that amount or when it might kick in, but that's um, just what I'm hearing so far. Now, the trash, the way it flows is that municipalities can either bring it directly to Cavant and Chester, in which case they can save the five bucks this year and still pay 53, or they bring it to one of the two county um, authority owned transfer stations, and then it goes to Cavant to be burned in Chester. And after it goes there, the ash is then brought to Berks County to the Rolling Hills landfill to be disposed of. Now, there are a lot of things shaking up at the Solid Waste Authority. The Solid Waste Authority is a seven person board with rotating terms. The current county council managed to appoint um, two new members um, in their first year in October, 2020. One of the other members resigned earlier this year um, because of corruption he was trying to bring to light and he was frustrated apparently and that um, is something that revolved around the um, solicitor at the time who was triple dipping, getting paid three different ways. And that solicitor has been since replaced. And so the person who resigned was replaced by Christine Ruther who's also a county council member but currently sitting on the Salt Waste Authority board as well. Um, I believe she will be stepping down this October and her seat and another seat that comes up for renewal or reappointment rather um, will be replaced. And so the county council will then have four out of seven seats on this authority. The CEO of the authority, Joseph Astoria, um, he was expecting to retire as soon as the landfill expansion permit was approved, um, but happened to, and we learned this um, a couple weeks later, um, after he passed away, but we found out that he passed away the, the same day that there was the first ever public hearing um, that the Solid Waste Authority held um, and was on this issue of what to do about the Kvanta contract. Okay, moving on. So where Delaware County's municipal waste goes, um, the latest data available on this, um, there's a first quarter of 2020 now, 2021 now available, but the first full, last four years, last year, and this is information you can get on this Pennsylvania DEP website. And you'll see that 81% of the county's waste goes to the incinerator in Chester. Another 17% goes directly to a landfill in Bucks County. And then the rest is just small fractions. About 1% goes to the Cavanta incinerator in Montgomery County, and then some tiny fractions of a percent to three other landfills. And you can see the percentage of the county's trash that has gone to Cavanta has actually bounced up and down a bit. I can't find any rhyme or reason in why um, we see that big dip in the trends we see there, um, but maybe that'll be something we figure out as we research things more. Now, one of the more shocking things is to see how much Pennsylvania is a huge importer of trash. And I have a um, slide coming up on that in general, but this is just for the incinerator in Chester. You can see all the states shaded in red, plus Canada and Puerto Rico, have sent waste to Cavanta and Chester at one time. Now, most of this is from New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia area, um, but literally all these places have sent some amount of waste to the Chester incinerator at some point. Now, if you look at where it's come from overall, the, the amounts, you'll see about 30% has come from Delaware County. Um, about 26% from Philadelphia, about close to 20% from New York, um, the rest from New Jersey. Used to be a, a good chunk from Delaware, but that's basically stopped, and bits and pieces from many other places. Now, the current data on that is um, much more focused um, geographically. We see 31% from Philadelphia, 31% from Delaware County. The Delaware numbers that show up are actually rerouted Manhattan trash that goes through Chester Gets turn, goes um, through Chester on trains. When they first did this, they were promising the Chester residents that it would be better to get trains instead of trucks. And then they ended up getting both because they send the trains through Chester. Instead of stopping at the incinerator, they go through Chester to Wilmington, Delaware, get turned around onto trucks, then truck back into Chester. So that shows up in the data as being Delaware waste, but it's mostly New York City. Now, the county's landfill I found to be interesting because only um, about a quarter of it, 26% of the, 
of the waste sitting in the county's landfill, which is in Berks County, is from the county. The other 74% is from other counties and states, including the ash that is burned in Chester, but comes from trash from other places, but also ash brought directly in from incinerators in Montgomery County in New Jersey. They're taking sewage sludge incinerator ash from Passaic County, New Jersey. Um, they were taking other waste from throughout Berks County, including biomass incinerator ash. And depending on who you listen to, this landfill that they've allowed um, through what I would consider to be um, poor public management of a county-owned facility to be given away to out-of-county sources to such a high degree, they expect it to fill up next year. And some are saying early next year, the landfill manager um, for the authority herself told me October of next year. And there's one final expansion that's allowed um, under a settlement of a lawsuit with Berks County and that's going to be a vertical expansion um, that should buy about 10 years of space under the status quo disposal rates. Hmm. Now, publicly owned waste facilities don't usually look like what we see happening with the county uh, authorities landfill. They usually take waste only from within their county, conserving space for them, their own use. Whereas it's the private facilities that tend to import as much as they can to maximize profits. And Pennsylvania, since they first started studying this about 30 years ago, has consistently been the largest importer of trash, mostly because so many of our landfills have been privatized. And about 40% of all the waste that's been ever dumped or burned in Pennsylvania since they started tracking this has been out of state waste, mostly to the private facilities. But the Solid Waste Authority has been managing their landfill like a private waste facility, giving away nearly three quarters of their waste to out of county and out of state dumpers. This here is a chart of the solid waste facilities in Pennsylvania that are publicly owned. Eight of them are landfills, three are incinerators. And you'll see the second to last, the one with the highest amount of out of state waste and second highest amount of out of county waste is the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority's landfill. It's one of a few landfills that's operated as a pretty much an anomaly within Pennsylvania and an anomaly in general. When I research landfills in Maryland, which are almost all in the public sector, they act like the ones you see that are just in the solid blue lines where they only take their own waste, not others' waste. So why is it important to act now? There are two main reasons. One is that the county's waste contract with Cavanta is coming up very soon. We don't know if they'll be making a decision in July, August, or if it'll be pushed back after that. Um, but we do know that it's coming up soon enough that we need to be taking action now. We also are starting to see um, some success in our efforts to get zero waste resolutions passed in municipalities that are urging the Solid Waste Authority and the County Council to do what they can to transition away from incineration towards zero waste management strategies. Um, these are the um, municipalities that passed resolutions so far. Um, there are other ones that are currently considering it. And we're looking for help with anyone um, who lives anywhere in Delaware County who wants to help get resolutions passed in municipalities that have not yet passed them. So, and sorry for the screaming children in the background. I can't control the noise outside my window. Um, so this is the incinerator in Chester. And they are, um, well, this is just some background. I won't walk you through all of it, but just some of the owners, when they owned it, the descriptions, um, the terms that they like to use, like trash to steam, waste to energy, that are unscientific and improper terms for waste incineration or trash incinerators. Um, the official legal term is municipal waste combustor, which EPA has stated multiple times means the same thing as trash incinerator. Um, so don't get caught up in these um, PR terms that they prefer to use, um, like energy from waste, waste to energy, um, these are not literally turning trash into steam or waste into energy. Um, these are just PR terms um, to make them sound better. Now, they are the largest. I know Kavanta has disputed me in a public hey, meeting. Hey, Mike. Yes. Can you just butt in for one second? So are they generating electricity by burning that stuff or not? Yes, they are. And okay. what we often come back at them with is we say we like to call them waste of energy facilities. Because if you look at it, um, as they have done in a study that was done several years ago, um, in how much energy value is destroyed by incinerators, you find that you can actually save 
three to five times more energy by recycling and composting the same materials that are burned in incinerators than you can get back by burning it. So even though they do produce some energy, um, if you look at the whole picture, we know that there's a lot more energy that takes to make paper, to make other materials, and that it's better to save that embodied energy and not have to recreate them than to think that burning them is somehow um, good overall because it's actually far more harmful than any of the other alternatives. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, so Cavantes disputed me and say, we're not the largest trash incinerator in the US. And I wrote to them, Don Camarada, after the public hearing on May 5th and said, Don, you're trying to refute me on this one. And th this is pretty, um, well-established fact here. It's not like one of these things that's subject to interpretation. So I said, Don, can you please point me to any incinerator in the US that's bigger than yours? And that was over a month ago. I've received no response um, because he can't. Um, the industry's own directory documents that it's the largest one, 3,500 tons per day. Um, there is no other one that has more than four boilers. They have six and none of them approach the 3,500 tons per day capacity. Now, not only are they the largest, but they are the one with the fewest pollution control devices on them, which is kind of shocking. Now, they were questioned about this by an EPA inspector back in 2009. And um, this inspector asked them, well, why are you missing these two of the four pollution control devices that most incinerators have? One of which reduces the nitrogen oxides that trigger asthma attacks. And the other one is the one on the carbon injection system, like Brita filter material basically sprayed into the exhaust that takes out the most toxic compounds that are released by incinerators like mercury and dioxins. And this, um, the second part below here um, on the slide is a direct screen capture of part of that inspector's report. You can read the whole report on, on the web link best here. And Cavanta's staff person at the time said, oh, it would cost a lot of money and create operational issues if we had to do that. And now, many years later, they're finally thinking about maybe installing one of those missing control devices for the nitrogen oxides that trigger asthma attacks. And yet they are not trying to um, come down to the modern standards um, of 45 parts per million. They're trying to bring it down to something um, two to three times that um, if they install these new controls. Uh, so this gets into a little bit about those missing controls. Won't belabor that point but happy to answer questions about it. Um, the acronyms here are, are just for different types of control devices, but you'll see that of the six incinerators in the state, all of them have three, four, or five pollution control devices, and the one in Chester being the largest have two. Cavantor operates five of these six incinerators, so we know they can do this, and they do it at their other plants, um, but for some reason at this plant, um, they say that their type of burner is special and therefore they have lower emissions and there's some truth to that it seems, um, but that doesn't change the fact that they are still putting out huge amounts of pollution and are the largest air polluter in Chester. Um, this is just a comparison to other ones they have around the country, some of as many as six control devices in, in Chester they have too. Okay, so as far as them being the largest air polluter, they are the number one air polluter in the city of Chester. No one's disputing that. Um, Kavanta finds different ways to dodge that question, but I don't think even they can dispute that. That's data that they report to the government. Now, they're the number one or two air, largest air polluter in the county, depending on um, which pollutant you're looking at or if you're adding them all up in what span of years, um, because the oil refinery and trainer is also a pretty large polluter. So sometimes um, they're second to that in certain measures. Um, but they're also one of the top air polluters in the entire seven county Philadelphia area. And all five trash incinerators that operate within that seven county area are among the top 10 air polluters in that seven county area. This is the actual data that they report to the state. Um, this is the average um, over 2016 through 2019. And you can see where they rank within Delaware County for a number of these pollutants. They're the number one source in the county. Um, of course, they will come back and argue, well, cars are bigger. And if you add up the whole transportation sector, you know, they're bigger for some of these pollutants. And that's correct for some of the pollutants that are known to come out of vehicles. Um, a lot of these pollutants, though, like lead, mercury, cadmium, some of these really toxic metals, they are not, the hydrochloric acid also, they're not things you're going to see from these other sources. 
And for example, mercury, there are over half of all the mercury emitted in the entire county. And that's even if you try to add in all the cars, you don't really have any appreciable mercury from there. So they can't win the argument on some of the more toxic chemicals. But for the fossil fuels that are um, burned to heat buildings and run vehicles, yes, they, they like to factor that in to make it look smaller. But compared to the industrial sources, they're number one or two in most measures. Now, there have been some claims made that we should that we're chasing the wrong bunny, that we should be looking at Delcora instead. Now, Delcora is only a block away from Cavanta in Chester. It's the county authorities um, facility that is a sewage treatment plant that also has a sewage sludge incinerator inside of it. And they are also a large polluter. They're, um, I think, the second largest air polluter in Chester now that Kimberly Clark switched fuels in the past year. And they, are a serious problem. They are considering doubling the amount of sewage that they take to Delcora. They wanna take the, um, not just the Western half of the county sewage, but the Eastern half as well that currently goes to Philadelphia. They're also trucking in waste from all over. Um, but even if they doubled the size of the, the sewage sludge incinerator burning in, um, at Delcora, it's still very evident from the data that Cavanta is a much bigger polluter. Um, even if you just look at the county's portion of it, the 31% thir that comes from the county's waste, just that 31% is far greater than everything that Delcora emits. So I put some slides together on that. We can just run through quickly. You'll see on greenhouse gases, the total amount from Cavant is in blue. The county's portion of that blue, um, which is the orange one, that's the 30%, 31%. So if we, we win our campaign, and the Solid Waste Authority chooses not to keep burning the county's trash, then we'll see up to 31% of those emissions reduced to the extent that Cavanta can't easily fill that with other people's waste, and they'll try, but it won't be easy. And the Delcora amount of greenhouse gases is far lower than either one of those. And you see the same thing in other measures. I couldn't stretch this slide tall enough to get the Delcora bar to even be visible. Um, it's just that much lower than the Cavanta numbers on hydrochloric acid emissions. And if you look at the nitrogen oxides that trigger asthma attacks, also far worse from Cavanta. Same thing if you look at what are called some of the criteria air pollutants, the particulate matter, the fine particulate matter, which is this really dangerous stuff, the PM2.5, the sulfur dioxides or the volatile organic compounds, Cavanta beats them even if you're looking at just the third of them. The Toxic metals, the, the one thing that Delcora is worse on is mercury if you're comparing to just the 31% of Cavanta. Of course, overall Cavanta is still worse on that one. So that's the only one that you, they almost have an argument if they're saying we should pay more attention to Delcora. So we wanna pay attention to Delcora, but we're prioritizing appropriately here by looking at the biggest polluter and the need to address them. So um, Cavanta has made this interesting claim recently. This is a relatively new argument for them. They've been saying that not almost 100%, 99% plus of what comes out of the stack are normal components of air, including water vapor, nitrogen, et cetera. And they include CO2 in that. Of course, CO2 is a global warming gas. So it's still a pollutant, even though it's a normal component of air. Um, so that shouldn't be um, something that we ignore. However, it's important to understand that the amounts that are still coming out that make them one of the largest sources of, of pollution for toxic metals and dioxins and other pollutants are still very significant, even if they're a small percentage of all the water vapor and other gases that are coming out of the smokestack. So it's important to understand how to debunk their emissions claims. So I wanna walk through this in a minute. Um, their first main claim is that they're within their permit limits. And they have graphs and say, oh, we're way below our permit limit, therefore don't worry. And that's not correct because there are actually quite a few violations that they've racked up, including um, seven that they were um, hit with by DEP just last month. They are also a 30 year old incinerator that's held to permit limits that are far weaker than limits for any modern facilities. So if they were given a permit as a new facility in the past decade, they would have to shut down right away because they cannot come close to meeting the emission standards of any of the incinerators that were given a permit in the past decade, including um, one that was permitted in Pennsylvania uh, for Allentown, but we ended up stopping that. But nonetheless, these, those emissions limits that are in those permits are not something they can meet. Um, Zeline, I see your hand is up. Uh, do you wanna jump in? 
Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, Michael, you're doing wonderful, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just want to ask a question, Michael, on um, Covantis' claim that they are um, a much better operated facility than the past operators of the incinerator. I know you did a comparative of the violations when it was Westinghouse and American Repul. Did you see any difference in the violations of, of air emissions? Um, good question, and I um, I don't have that spreadsheet in front of me, and it's not as committed to memory as I should be. Um, there was a difference, um, I believe, um, that I think they fall in the middle of the first two companies that operated it. I think. Um, if I'm remembering right, and I should just follow up later with the details, but I think Westinghouse was the worst. Red Fuel was, I think, the least bad of them, and Cavanta fell in the middle. Um, but it also varied um, over time. And so I think Cavanta um, was better in one range of years, but far worse in another range. Um, but before, since this is recorded, I don't want to um, say more without checking the numbers and sharing them, but I can make those available. Uh, yeah, I messed up something. All right. Thank you, Mike. Sure. So one of the other pieces of this that is often misunderstood is that permit limits are not based on health and safety. And I had a DEP engineer who does air permitting um, for another part of the state in a public meeting, and we have this on video, admit on the record that the permit limits are not based on health and safety. They're technology-based standards based on what the facility can meet. And so when Kavanta makes this claim that, oh, well, we're within our permit limits, therefore, don't worry, be happy, that's not what that means. And the next point is kind of bring that home a little bit. The permit limits are concentration-based. So if you had a 500 ton per day incinerator that is allowed to emit a certain amount of parts per million of a certain pollutant, well, if you compare that to this one that's allowed to that is a 3,500 ton per day incinerator, they are allowed to put out seven times more pollution than that smaller one, just because they're bigger. And that's how basically all of our air pollution regulations are based. They're based on concentrations coming out of the stack, but if you're bigger, you get to be dirtier. So there's no um, comfort that should come with knowing that they're within their limits when they're the massive size that they are. Now, they also don't know for most pollutants how polluting they are. At this incinerator, they only continuously test for four pollutants. For the rest of them, and they generally test one day a year. Now for some pollutants like dioxins, the most toxic chemicals known to science, we know from a study in Europe that when they continuously test for the, that pollutant, the actual emissions are 30 to 50 times higher than what we think they are in the US when they test for only six hours a year under the testing protocols that EPA requires. So that could be somewhat true for other pollutants as well, but we just don't know. And the analogy I like to make is if we regulated motorists on the highway the same way we regulate smokestacks in this country, we would let people drive around all year with no speedometer and once a year, there will be a speed trap set and there'll be signs saying, warning, slow down speed trap ahead. And then the brother of the driver will be running the speed trap because the companies do their own testing. That is literally how most pollutants at most things with smokestacks in this country are actually regulated. They don't know, and no one knows if they're speeding the other 364 days of the year because no one's actually looking. And that's one of the things that we'd love to see corrected if they were required by the state or eventually maybe local governments to continuously monitor more pollutants. Now, Kavanta has also been known to rig their tests. Um, we don't know how widespread this is because it's rare that these things leak out. However, they've been busted at least once um, in Connecticut for having um, rigged their continuous emissions monitors to make it look like their emissions are lower than they actually are. And there was something similar more recently in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they were also fined um, by the attorney, um, or I think it was the federal, like a, an attorney general, or um, I'll, I forget the exact title. Um, it's in some of the stuff we documented. Um, it was a federal um, attorney that in, in was involved in that. Um, the Excuse me, Mike. Go ahead, yes. 
Weren't they also busted in Newark for rigging their uh, continuous admission monitors? Um, I'm not aware they of They were anything. saying that they had problems and it was offline due to power, but then they, it was proven that the power wasn't out. Um, I would love to see that. That's possible. Um, I'm just not familiar okay. with that example, to be honest. Um, right. we, we do know from people who used to work at other Cavanta incinerators, however, that there's the practice of during their annual stack tests when they're basically turning in their homework assignment once a year and saying, this is how we are all the time. Well, they've been known to collect the trash that they think burns cleaner like cardboard and pile that up on one side of the tipping floor and use that when legally that is not allowed. They're supposed to burn waste that's representative of what they normally burn. Um, so we don't know how widespread this practice is, but what we understand from this employee is that it's um, is not uncommon. Um, so the final point on this is that for a lot of the pollutants that they release, there is no safe dose. So when they're putting out something that might be within the emissions limit for mercury or dioxin, there is no safe amount of it. And what we find is that on the Delaware River, there are actually fish consumption advisories for mercury um, that you're not supposed to eat more than a certain amount of fish because the mercury in those fish is a dangerous level. And we know that Cavanta is responsible for, I think the latest numbers were 56% of the mercury released from all industrial sources, which is basically all sources of mercury in Delaware County. Okay, and um, the last point on this, this section is um, what I mentioned earlier, that they're finally considering introducing nitrogen oxide controls, but have not committed to that. And it looks like they're not even going to do um, the moderately strict um, standard that some of their incinerators are, are coming up um, to have to meet. Um, it looks like they're gonna do something even weaker um, than we were expecting from them. Okay, so here's the, the piece on violations. Um, we found when we studied all the information on the DEP website for the six trash incinerators in the state that they're the second worst in the number of violations for air specifically, but for all violations as well since 2017. They're, um, one that's number one is also run by Cavanta and that's in Montgomery County. And these numbers are actually lower than they actually are. Um, one of them is the one that was from last month and is counted as one, but it's actually seven violations in one um, issuance of a violation. And so that number 44 you see is actually 166 separate violations that Cavanta and Chester's had since 2010. So Cavanta's also made the claim that health studies show that there's nothing to worry about, that they have never found health effects around trash incinerators, they put this fact sheet out a couple of years ago, making this argument. Well, I dug into their footnotes. I dug into the footnotes of their footnotes. And I also looked into newer research that came out um, since then and put something together um, a year later, so one year ago, and found that there are a number of studies that they either didn't summarize correctly or just missed entirely that did find health effects. And it's hard to find these. It's hard to do studies that actually find health effects because there are other sources of pollution, people move, pollution moves. There are a lot of reasons why it's hard to do a good study on this. But the ones that have found effects, most of them were finding elevated cancers. Um, some of them also found respiratory diseases, cardiovascular and urinary diseases that were increased as well. And this is all cited and documented um, at this link. So if you want to dig into our website, you can find all the original studies um, on that. Now, last time we were able to get data that's local, and this has been a struggle. We're working on getting newer data as soon as we can, um, but the latest data we've managed to get from the state was on the childhood asthma hospitalization rate. And we found that in Chester's zip code, it's three times the state average. And um, Delaware County itself is above the state average, um, but Chester is far above the county. Um, so let's talk about environmental justice for a minute. I mean, environmental justice is the term used to describe the movement's response to the phenomenon of environmental racism, which is essentially the disproportionate impact on people of color by noxious industries, such as incinerators, um, hazardous waste facilities, and other facilities that tend to be located more in communities of color, or at least the biggest and more polluting ones and the concentrations of them especially tend to be located in communities of color. Um, let's see, a question is the best study of um, 
Um, Larry, I don't know of any studies that have been done of the health effects of people um, in the Chester area um, since that incinerator has been built, other than the fact that EPA did one where they didn't actually do a new study, but in the mid 90s, um, they collected some existing data that's out there and we found a number of health impacts that were quite elevated. And I think the blood lead levels were the worst in the state. Um, yeah, and the cancers. Cancers, um, there were, I think low birth weight babies were also um, one of the highest in the state or, or very out there. So the, the latest data that is covering those different health effects is unfortunately um, from that EPA collection of data in the mid nineties. And that's why we're trying to um, find ways that we can get data that's not just county-wide statistics like the Department of Health has at the state level, but stuff that can break it down to the city level and actually show us something more meaningful. Um, and there are multiple experts in the field that have seen the situation in Chester and described as the worst case of environmental racism that they've ever seen. Um, so whether it's the worst, one of the worst is definitely up there. Now, um, this is a, an image from um, the Laid to Waste documentary that came out in 1996. Um, Zeline's um, group, the Chester Residents Concerned for Quality Living, have um, had an office in Chester that was broken into twice in the 90s. And once they scrawled KKK on the wall and Racism usually isn't this obvious, um, but we don't know who did that. Um, but the fact that it happened means that it's about race to someone. And I know a lot of white people like to retreat and say, well, isn't this all about class? Isn't this all because people are poor? And what we find when we study it is actually no, it's more about race than it is about class. And that's just statistically looking at this and other industries. Um, that's what we tend to find. So if we look at the incinerator versus the county's landfill, we see that it's, it's a very stark difference, um, about almost 97% white around the landfill, um, about 64% black around the incinerator, and the incinerator with the very tall smokestack reaches far beyond that radius as well, so it reaches a lot more people. Um, the household income is a very stark contrast between 73 and 30,000, um, it's a big difference. And the population impact is something we also tend to see a lot. Landfills are in more rural areas, usually. Incinerators um, can often, especially the bigger ones, be in more urban areas. And so just the sheer number of people impacted is a case for why we shouldn't be incinerating waste. Now, we built tools that enable us to look at whole industries at a time in terms of establishing whether there is an environmental racism or classism trend in that industry. And when we looked at the six trash incinerators in Pennsylvania, we found a very stark um, disparity. And the way you can understand this chart is that anything with the ratio, ratio above the one line means that they're disproportionately impacted. So all these distances, all the way from one mile to 250 miles away from the aggregate of the six incinerators in the state, white people are less impacted than usual, which means people of color are more impacted than they should be if things were fairly distributed and black people are hit the hardest. And that's largely, of course, because of Chester and Harrisburg where those two incinerators are located. And you also see a big difference in the income, 46,000 median household income between all the incinerators in the state combined. But if you look at the landfills, it jumps up to 53. And you'll see that with the landfills, it's in the opposite direction. It's actually disproportionately impacting white people more um, than if it were fairly distributed. Um, so just in terms of the number of people impacted, but also the environmental racism and classism dimensions of this, um, just as systemically throughout the state, and we find this around the country too, um, is just a very strong case for not using the incinerator industry. So let's talk about why incinerators are a problem. Um, there's a lot of information on our website. Um, I encourage you to explore the incineration page that we have, because there's some new reports and fact sheets there that um, will get you a lot more details. Now, one of the pieces there is on incinerator closures. Um, there are 45 incinerators in the US that close, trash incinerators that closed since 2000. One is not in the study, so it just happened in January. Um, but the 44 that closed in that, in that span between 2000 and 2020, they were only 23 years old on average when they closed. Now, the Chester incinerator is already 30 years old this year, and only four of them have made it past their 40th birthday 
without being completely rebuilt. The one in Harrisburg is much older, but that had to be completely rebuilt because it was falling apart and having all kinds of problems. And that ended up bankrupting Harrisburg as I warned them in 2003 what happened. And eight years later, they went bankrupt. Now, incineration, I've argued, is the most expensive and polluting way to manage waste or to make energy. And that's a bit of an anomaly in Delaware County on the financial end of it in part because the county is subsidizing them with discounted ash dumping at their landfill, but also because this is the largest incinerator in the country, so they have an economy of scale, and they're missing two of the four pollution control devices that most have, which makes it a lot more affordable to run. Um, the, the air pollution controls on incinerators are usually the largest expense, and so for them to not have to pay that um, makes this probably their most profitable plant in the company's fleet. Now, even given that, um, it's still very expensive in terms of the social impact, which we'll get into, but we find that they're also more polluting than coal plants. They're worse than directly landfilling waste, and they still end up sending ash to landfills, making the landfills more toxic. So basically, whatever dimension you look at this through, financially, um, environmentally, on the energy side or the waste side, incinerators will lose that argument. Now, this is the industry's own data. Last time they did a survey, fee, sur uh, a tipping fee survey of incinerator, incinerators versus landfills in the US, they found that incinerators were more expensive um, around the US to use than landfills. And when you look at it from the energy side, the federal government put this out. And last time they actually included trash incinerators in this report, they stopped after 2012 because no one's building new ones. But when they did look at it, they found that they're the most expensive way to make energy too. So no one builds incinerators to make energy. They tout themselves as if they're energy generating plants, but no one in the right mind would spend this kind of money um, just to make electricity when everything else is going to be more affordable for them. Now, we also found that they're more polluting than coal plants. Um, New York State did a similar study and found that by all but one pollutant they looked at, um, trash incinerators are more dirty than the coal plants in their state. Um, but this is the best I could do as a national analysis. And some of these are, are statewide statistics um, where they're available as well. Now, just on the global warming emissions, we find that they're actually two and a half times as bad as coal. But the industry makes this argument that they're a global warming solution. And EPA will sometimes back them up on this convoluted logic where they say, well, about half our emissions don't count because, you know, it came from things that grew in the ground and trees sucked that back up. That's been scientifically debunked many times over for over 10 years now. But they still will make this argument and say, well, we're displacing dirty energy sources on the grid and therefore um, we should subtract that. And they do all these subtractions and to get to a point where they say we're a climate solution, which is just preposterous when you look at how much is actually coming out of your stack. And the fact that if they shut them down, they can't just replace them with a fossil fuel generator, except in Pennsylvania, waste coal burners count in the state um, alternative energy law as well, but they can't crank them up anymore. So basically they would have to replace that with hydro or something cleaner. So they can't make this argument, but they try. So let's uh, compare to landfills now. Incinerators are worse than landfills, but the real comparison is what not landfills versus having an incinerator in an ash landfill, but both of those versus zero waste and minimizing landfilling. And we'll get into what that looks like in a little bit. The ash side of it, incinerators for every 100 tons you burn produce about 30 tons of toxic ash. And the reason why I have coffee beans pictured here is it's an analogy that if you pour water over coffee beans, you're not gonna get coffee, right? But if you grind them up and increase their surface area and pour water over them, you get coffee. It's the same thing with ash in a landfill. You're increasing the surface area and you're enabling the toxic metals that are in there, other toxic chemicals that are created in the combustion process to blow off the landfill and get into the air to leach into the groundwater at the landfill, you're just doing more damage by putting ash there than if you just put the trash there in the first place directly. Now, when we compared using DEP's data for the Southeast and South Central regions where all six incinerators are and the number of landfills in there, they actually take almost identically on the same amount of waste as the incinerators combined. So this is a pretty even comparison. 
and the air emissions from those landfills versus these incinerators, the greenhouse gases are about 80% worse than incinerators, or sorry, the incinerators are worse than the landfills by 80%. And for all the other health damaging pollutants, you get about 64 or 60% 60 more pollution coming out of incinerators than the landfills. Now, when we do a more rigorous life cycle analysis, because this is just looking at how much air pollution there is in one year, and it's a fair argument to say, well, landfills will be around longer and they'll still create damage. So we did a life cycle analysis and we looked at nine different criteria and found that looking at it from that perspective, their incinerators are about twice as bad as landfills, even for global warming. Um, this is from a study of Cavantes Incinerator in Montgomery County, Maryland, where we did this analysis and compared to 10 landfills, most of which are in Pennsylvania, and found that on almost all the criteria, incinerators were worse. And all the big ones, the big criteria like global warming, the toxic chemicals, the smog formation that leads to asthma, um, those are the ones that incinerators are definitely worse and are the bulk of the um, difference that you see between them. This um, red bar is the incinerator in that study. The yellow bars are different landfills. And you can just see how much of a difference there is if you add it all up and put a dollar value on it, say how much damage is being caused to health and the environment per ton of waste disposed. This is not what you're paying per ton. This is what you're paying in your health bills. What you're paying in environmental damage is $258 a ton to incinerate and bury the ash in a landfill. And half or less than that to put it straight in the landfill. And one of the arguments we've even heard made in Delaware County from some of the Solid Waste Authority members is, well, what about trucking? Isn't it a big deal if we have to truck it further and reach a landfill? Because all those diesel trucks are going to emit a lot of pollution. Well, that's a very common argument. We've faced it in other jurisdictions as well. And so that was part of the study. It included the trucking. And the trucking, or in one case, by train, which is the rail transport in black, but most of them are by truck because most don't have rail access, we find it's about 3% of the total impacts of the waste system is from the transportation. Most of it is from the incinerator or the landfill itself. So anytime someone says, oh, well, if we have to truck it hundreds of miles away, we don't have to go nearly that far in this case. But even if we had to go a thousand miles away, the trucking emissions are not going to come close to making a difference in turning this argument in favor of incineration. So um, I, this is a fun slide for me to make um, because I was gonna flood fill the states that send trash to Pennsylvania. And actually it was easier to flood fill the six that do not um, because every other state, 44 of them, plus DC, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Bermuda and Canada have sent waste to Pennsylvania. Um, so this is part of the answer to the argument of, well, where's our waste gonna go? If we don't burn it in Chester, where can it go? And there's been this hand wringing, even by some of the authority members saying, well, we're not sure there's enough space. And I find that interesting because Pennsylvania has a problem that's the opposite. Our problem is that we're the largest importer of trash and have been for at least 30 years because we have too much landfill space permitted. We have 43 landfills and six trash incinerators and the state has enabled them to have a combined permitting that's two to three times the amount that we generate which is why in some years, um, at the worst of it, Pennsylvania has dumped or burned twice as much waste in Pennsylvania than Pennsylvania's generate. And because of the Commerce Clause, we can't legislate and pass a law that says no more out-of-state waste, but we can stop the over-permitting. The state can have facilities dial back how much they're allowed to dump or burn in a given year and stop this waste importation problem. Um, but the point in, of this in this conversation is just that there is no such thing as running out of space for the waste that we have. They can shut the incinerator down tomorrow and there will be so many landfills with capacity that it's not going to be a hard time figuring out which ones to use first. Now, this is a map of the landfills in the state and surrounding area. The red one is the one that's owned by Delaware County. Um, there are three others within the same county and another one right across the border. Um, so even if the Rolling Hills landfill closed tomorrow and Cavanta closed tomorrow, um, within that same trucking distance, you have plenty of other options. So one of the other arguments is, well, do we have time? Can we switch away from incineration so quickly? And 
I find that interesting because there are some communities like Detroit and Hartford, Connecticut, and Norton, Virginia, which have abruptly faced incinerator closures. That fire is actually the one that happened at Cavanza's um, incinerator in Norton, Virginia, where in 2017, their plant had such a bad fire in February that was closed for until the very end of the year. And DC and Northern Virginia had to reroute their trucks and send it to Southeastern Virginia landfills. And no one had waste piling up on their curb. And similar crises happened in Detroit and Hartford and they figured it out and they brought it to landfills. And that was an overnight situation in all three of those situations. Um, this is not what we're dealing with where we have um, most of a year to line up contracts, figure out what landfills things should go to and come up with a, a system that won't be a shock to anyone. Now, if one of the arguments that's been made is that if Delaware County stops sending its waste to the incinerator, won't Cavanta just take other people's trash and fill it up? Well, I don't think that's very true because there's not a big chunk of waste equivalent to 380,000 tons a year that can be contracted with. New York already has a contract with Cavanta and a lot of that's coming to Chester. Philadelphia also does. Neither of them are likely to massively ramp that up. Baltimore just signed a new 10-year contract with the incinerator within their city, and so they're not going to start shipping to Pennsylvania. D.C. contrasts with that one that had the fire I just showed you, and if they do anything, they're going to switch away from incineration altogether, not start shipping it to a different Cavanta incinerator that's further away. So there is no big pocket of waste that they can contract with, and we know that before they got the New York City waste, they actually had a pretty sizable gap where they were short and needed to fill that up. And they did get that big New York City contract, um, but it's not a given that if we take away their 31% from Delco, or possibly if Philadelphia doesn't keep sending their 31% to Chester either, um, it might be pretty hard for them to fill that up. And they might have to shut down some of their six boilers to um, not um, be operating at that same capacity. So um, another straw man argument that's been made here is that this idea that we've been saying that if the county ends this contract that the incinerator will shut down. Well, we've never made that claim. Um, some have tried to put that in our mouths to be able to have an argument to shoot down. Um, but we think more realistically what will happen is maybe they'll shut down one or two of their boilers. Um, maybe they'll start finding some waste from elsewhere, but I don't think they're going to find that full 31% anytime soon. And cutting off the flow of waste is the quickest way to have immediate public health and environmental benefits by reducing that amount of pollution that comes from that 31% of what they burn. Um, there's no way of adding pollution controls to the plant that will happen in that same kind of time frame. That can take them many years if they could do it at all. So that's one of the other arguments is, well, wh why don't we just have them put extra pollution controls on? Well, it's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. There's no way to make incineration a good idea. You can make it a less bad idea from one perspective and then you just make the ash more toxic and it makes it worse for the landfill community. Um, if you make the air less dangerous, it just transfers the pollution, it doesn't make it go away. Um, but we also know that it will take them some time to install those controls. So even if they do this one of the two missing controls that they're thinking about doing, we know it can take them probably six to seven years just to install them because we know we've heard from um, in Camden, they're considering installing missing controls there. They're missing a bag house. And they said that they would need to go through permitting for that, which that might take a year by itself. And that would take three years for their three burners um, to install that. One um, burner a year, they would shut down and replace. So with six burners here, I'm thinking six years, that's just, it doesn't make sense to spend that kind of time even if they're willing to spend that kind of money to have a meaningful reduction in pollution. So the cost to um, stop incinerating is worth looking at. This is basically the, the big reason why we um, might have a hard time winning is that the argument is, oh my God, it's gonna be this big price shock. Municipalities will have to pay a lot more and they haven't budgeted for it. And so we looked into that argument and we found that municipalities are currently paying $58 a ton to the authority. And that is the $5 increase from what it was just last year. And that the cheapest option should be using the authority's landfill directly and saving that space for the county and not giving 75% of it away to other people for their waste. 
but I figure the worst case scenario is if the county went to contracting, say, with Waste Management, the biggest waste company in the world, not promoting them over any other waste company, they have all kinds of issues as well, but they have a contract with Philadelphia that they signed two years ago at 65 a ton. In 2022, it'll be 72 a ton, which will be a 25% increase over Delaware County's current rate. Now, say this is what the county signs up with. They get a similar contract, pay a similar price to what Philadelphia is paying. Then the typical amount of waste generated in the county, which is not what it is right now, it's usually in a normal year about 355,000 tons. So we're looking at a little over $5 million increase per year countywide. If we add to that the 1.3 million it'll take to cover lost host fees that Chester City gets, so we're not causing them a financial hardship in the process, then we're looking at a total of 6.4 million a year, which is less than $1 a month per person in the county to pay. They're already looking at cranking up the rates anyway to pay for the county's landfill. So the idea that this is some outrageous amount that people would have to pay to stop getting polluted as much. Um, it just, it doesn't seem to wash. This is not an unreasonable amount of money um, to do the right thing. And um, this is just the memo showing it went up $5. We already talked about that. Um, so the question is, where is the money gonna come from? Well, um, the county council chair has already stated in the Delaware County Times that out of this 109 million from the American Rescue Plan that will be coming to the county, um, that's one of the things that they can be looking at to help with this. Um, but it was also in the context of an article where they said that the budget numbers for next year are looking really good and that they might even be looking at lowering taxes countywide because their budget for next year is so good. Now, I know it's hard for anyone to believe that anyone would ever lower taxes, but you know, it's possible, I suppose. Um, but Zydek was saying that the money could also possibly be used to stop using the incinerator. And uh, of course, we, we will love that idea. Now, what would it cost if we don't stop incinerating, if we keep doing this? Well, right now, we're looking at the fact that they're putting out so much particulate matter that when they studied this in Baltimore, they found that their incinerator was causing about $55 million a year in annual harm to health just from that one pollutant. And the Kvyat incinerator in Chester puts out a little over twice as much of that same pollutant. So we're looking at about $112 million a year in health damage just from one pollutant coming out of the smokestack. And the Delaware County trash portion, that would be $35 million a year just from Delaware County's waste being turned into pollution. Um, if you look at the asthma impacts, it's about $141 million a year um, that is attributable to the um, emissions that are coming out of Kavanta. And sorry, that's I think to this region, sorry, that's from the, um, the American Lung Association's analysis. Um, sorry, it's either them or the, sorry, it's the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. There are two different reports on, on this topic. Um, that, they're the one that put together the numbers on the economic harm. And so Delaware County, as a share of the US population, if it were equal, and we know Delaware County is not getting the average amount of pollution in this country, but if it did, we're looking at only $141 million a year in economic harm from asthma. And that's not just from Kavanta, but if we look at the Kavanta share of that, where Kavanta themselves has said they're about 10% of the county's pollution from nitrogen oxides, then we're looking at something in the realm of 4.4 million a year. So even conservatively looking at some of these numbers, the health and environmental impacts are nothing close to what we'd be asking the county to pay if it's going to cost us much more um, to avoid incineration. Um, if you look at that life cycle assessment and look at all the health and environmental costs, it's actually about $56 million a year more to incinerate than to landfill um, based on the emissions um, in this situation. Okay, so let's um, say a few words on zero waste and then I'll try to um, get through this because I know I'm over an hour here. Um, so zero waste um, basically means um, don't burn and avoid harmful effects to the environment. Um, it's defined in a way that prioritizes the not burning. And this is an internationally peer reviewed definition. Um, I actually helped create um, the zero waste hierarchy that goes along with this, um, that is also used as an international standard. And it makes it clear that incineration is unacceptable 
but there's a landfill at the back of the picture, no matter what you do. Um, it's just the goal is to make it a small, stable landfill, um, not the kinds that we currently have. And this is just broken down a little bit. You can see that there's a step after you do the forward thinking steps where you separate things and you want to separate the reusables. That's about 5% of the waste stream, but 50% of the economic value. So there's a lot of economic development that can come from reusing materials that are discarded and then all the different steps to recycle and compost effectively. And then you want to basically look at what's left. You want to mechanically pull out extra recyclables that people put in trash bins and then stabilize the organic fractions so that your landfill is not gassy and stinky. And that is what a zero waste system looks like. It's not a conventional landfill at the back end. It's one that is very small and dealing with something that's not such a nuisance because you process things properly. Um, this is just a bit of a recap where you can, you have basically three choices. You can landfill, we know that's bad. You can incinerate, we know that's even worse, even for the landfill community or you can do those final processing steps and have a much more manageable and smaller um, landfill. So some of the solutions, I know we've been putting this in the conversations around the zero waste resolutions. Um, one of the main solutions being um, unit-based pricing. They also call it pay as you throw or save as you throw. And that's where you basically you pay per bag or per bin. And when you do this, you find on average a 44% um, increase in recycling that happens. And you find about half of that, um, that progress is, sorry, 44% decrease in the amount of waste is, is the proper way to phrase that. And about half of that decrease is from people reusing and um, reducing more. So it's not even stuff at the curb that has to get picked up. The price signal alone, just like we pay for water, gas, and electricity by how much we use, when you do that for waste, people change their behavior and actually reduce, reuse, and recycle, and compost more if you give them the composting options. And um, there's also a picture here of um, deconstruction workers in Baltimore. That's another way to reduce a lot of the construction demolition waste, create a lot of jobs by not demolishing buildings, but take, taking them apart carefully and reusing and recovering those materials. All right, so last section in here. What about Chester? Now, of course, Chester gets the odors, the noise, the air pollution, the trash trains, the trash trucks, the ash trucks, but only six full-time jobs and under $5 million a year in host fees. Um, that's much less than the riverfront property could offer if we have responsible development. And if Chester residents wanted to have um, part of that development be related to the alternatives and zero waste, that's something that they could decide. Um, that conversation really hasn't taken place yet to any degree that I've noticed. Um, but there are a lot of possible development alternatives, not the gentrification plans that some are talking about, but ones that should have Chester residents at the forefront um, running it, um, not at someone else's table, but their own table, um, coming up with solutions that make sense for Chester. Now, incinerator jobs, when Kavanta responded to us, um, they presented in December on a podcast and we commented in the chat and Kavanta rebutted that um, and took 12 pages doing so. And they gave us a lot of um, data points. So I was not able to take that uh, um, information, make a chart out of it. And you can see that only six of their 100 full-time salaried employees are living in Chester. Um, most of them live much further. 71% um, of the workers choose to live more than five miles away from their employer, over half more than 10 miles away. Um, so even though they came to the community years ago with a host agreement that said, that they're gonna have a much higher percentage of people working there and even in management positions being Chester residents, they never really lived up to that promise. Um, now we know that incineration is the worst way to create jobs. Um, you get about 10 times more jobs with recycling, sorting, um, many more with the reuse. Um, so this has been analyzed and we know even it's worse, a bit worse than landfilling, but the reuse, re recycling, and composting all create far more jobs. So one of the other defenses we've heard when local governments are being approached with um, wanting people wanting them to pass zero waste resolutions is they say, well, we, we heard from Mayor Kirkland and um, he says that we, we shouldn't hurt the people in Chester. So we're not sure what to do. And there's a bit of like a, like a white guilt piece of this that might be going on, but folks that just don't know, like, well, should I, should I be listening to the mayor or should I be listening to the people of Chester? And the people of Chester have made it pretty clear um, whenever they have voiced um, themselves on this topic. Um, now, we know that Kirkland 
has also made it very clear where he stands. He urged city council to support the deal that enabled two to three decades of New York City trash trains to come to Chester, even though Chester residents packed City Hall twice, denouncing that and saying, no, we don't want this. He wrote, or actually he signed a letter that apparently Cavanta wrote in 2019 to Philadelphia saying, please send us Philadelphia's trash. So we know where Mayor Kirkman stands. We also know where the people stand because we've had over a thousand county residents so far sign petitions urging an end to incineration. And a lot of these were Chester residents as well. We also know that in the recent election, this was one of the issues in where Chester voters unseated a county or a city council member. Um, and this is one of the driving concerns um, that was related to that um, campaign. Um, we had a 150 plus March in Chester um, in late April for Environmental Justice Day. A lot of Chester residents present there despite Kirkland's statements to the contrary. Um, there were over 200 people who turned out for the Solid Waste Authority's first ever and only ever so far public hearing, um, passionately opposed to a new Cavanta contract and many Chester residents speaking up there. Well, there are only 23 people who got to speak, but some of them, Chester residents making a very strong case. And we know in 2014, when the New York City trash trains was um, an issue, there were Chester residents were the ones that distributed over 5,000 flyers that accomplished the packing City Hall twice, which is what happened. So when local officials say, well, what about Chester? You know, is passing a resolution, we have actually heard council members say, well, isn't this telling Chester what to do? And no, it's not telling Chester what to do. Chester government, of course, can still decide they want to burn their waste and it's not telling them otherwise. A zero waste resolution in another municipality saying, we want to take responsibility for our waste and where it goes and not be a part of the problem that is not just a problem for Chester because everyone else in the county is breathing this air too. You might not breathe it first, but you may be breathing it next. And it's an issue and a self-interest issue and a responsibility issue for all the municipalities that are helping um, have waste um, end up in Chester. And if Chester City, uh, or if Delaware County stopped sending waste there, um, there would be a possible up to $1.3 million that is lost in Chester's budget. And that's why we think it's important that making Chester whole financially is part of the responsibility of the county and all the municipalities in the county that have used Chester as a dumping ground for 30 years. It's only fair to not hurt Chester at the same time that we're making this problem, uh, that we're getting this problem resolved. Um, so uh, we'll just wrap it up here. These are the contact info um, for the Chester residents for quality living, um, which we'll have in the follow-up. Um, you'll get this if you don't already have it. And um, the beautiful new banner that um, one of the young women um, designed that was part of our march. And um, my contact info um, here if anyone wants to get in touch with me. The following is a brief substantive question and answer period. Um, has EPA fined Cavanta for their lack of pollution controls? No, EPA has not fined them for lack of pollution controls because their permit does not require them to have those specific controls. As long as they're able to meet a certain concentration in a 30-year-old permit, then they're allowed to be considered to be following the rules. So we think that's outdated, um, that even though they might be following the right concentration in a permit, when they do monitor and some usually are within that limit, um, that that's not adequate um, because they ought to be monitoring continuously and they ought to put in the controls that they're capable of having, um, even if they're extra in terms of going beyond the permit requirement, just because they're so big and they should be putting out less pollution just because they can. No. And, and 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 we have to deal with the um with the um um the thought process. It, yes, it's it's called the Environmental Protection Agency, but that's not really what they do. Yes, it's called the Department of Environmental Protection, but that's not what they do. The DEP is the state agency; they are the regulatory authority. However. They are in the business to issue permits to pollute. That's their job. Their job is to issue those permits. And when there are fines that are attributed to the pollution uh, industries, many times those fines are negotiated fine. 
so it's almost built in as a cost of business to pollute and not do what's necessary to protect people. Um, so it says, um, how does Delco avoid paying the penalty fees if they do not send a certain amount of trash? Well, the way that the county can avoid that is by not having a contract that has a put or pay clause in it. So right now we're not at risk of having to pay that penalty because we first have to get the waste reduction programs in place so we can get below that 300,000 tons per year. Uh, but we don't want to find ourselves locked into another longer term contract or any contract that says you have to produce a certain amount of trash or pay us anyway. That's just really inappropriate. And it seems that um, some of the folks in charge of making that decision are not inclined to allow that kind of contract to go forward. So um, we might be lucky um, to see that in the right place soon. Has any of the Chester City electorate ever done anything to hold Kavanta accountable? Um, Stefan Roots is um, a challenger for the Democratic primary who won against both incumbents. And one of the issues that came up in that primary election is that both of the city council incumbents in Chester, um, Portia West and Al Jacobs, voted in favor of the two to three decades of New York City trash trains coming to be burned in Chester. So that um, bothered a lot of people and was one of the factors that led to Stefan Roots um, beating both of them in the primary election. Um, other than that, I can just say that those other times that Chester residents have packed City Hall, um, even though it was not an election process, um, is an indication that Chester residents- No, I, 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 I'll talk to it as a Chester resident. Please. They have gone uh, above and beyond the call of duty. In fact, the day that we held our Environmental Justice Day March, the mayor basically came out as the spokesperson for Covanta, saying what a wonderful community partner they are. They are doing absolutely nothing wrong. He has said in previous council meetings that he knows of nobody, nobody, including his 13 grandchildren that has an inhaler in Chester. And he was called to task for that. So they are more than cheerleaders. They are really have um, bedded themselves down with uh, 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 the incinerator, um, whether it be a front door deal or a back door deal, whatever it is, they are really, they, like I said, you see him in black and orange uh, looking like a mascot. Those are our traditional colors for the city, for our Chester High School and our sports teams. But clearly he rocks for the other side. He does not represent most of the residents in Chester on his views about the incinerator. They, they, they view that there are no health issues. If people in sick are, are, are sick in Chester, it's because they're just sick. Tina asks, I didn't know they incinerated sewage. Would a methane digester facility be an alternative to this? How about a methane digesting compost using methane to generate electricity or as a gas supply? Um, so the quick answer is yes. Incinerating sewage sludge is the worst thing you can do with it. Usually if you ask about anything that can be burned, the answer is incineration is not the best option. It's actually the worst option. Um, in the case of sewage sludge, one of the better ways to manage it is to digest it, to do this is basically composting in a vessel. So it doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away. You end up with that digested sewage sludge you still have to do something with, which is still toxic and dangerous. And it should go into a landfill after you digest it. But digesting will make sure that's not as gassy and stinky in that landfill. And you can get some energy off of it when you burn that methane rich gas. Um, and others are doing that in Philadelphia and many other places. Um, that's fairly typical. Incineration of sewage sludge is um, far less typical. Um, now Todd asks, how often is Kavanta D Kavanta's DEP permit up for renewal? And does it make sense to try to oppose renewal on the basis of the information you have presented? Are there objective criteria that the renewal is based on or is it basically automatic? Um, it's basically automatic it's extremely rare that an existing facility will have DEP turn down their permit renewal. In fact, they already are under what's called a permit shield for the air permit, which comes up, I think in September. 
And so I think it's every five years, they, it's called a Title V air permit because they're a major source of air pollution under the Clean Air Act, that's called Title V. And every five years, they have to renew that permit. Well, this permit, they are not coming up to modern standards. They are not even including the new pollution controls that they're talking about maybe installing in this permit. They're just gonna say, we want another five years of the status quo. And DEP will rubber stamp that no matter what we say which does not mean we shouldn't say things. We should speak up at public hearings. We should be as visible as we can in that space. And we should ask for more monitoring, more controls, all the things that are right to ask for. But, 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 but I, 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 I gotta say this, Michael. Yes. They have been stopped. There have been other companies, uh, other polluting facilities that have been stopped. Um, I have that optimism that as many collaborators and as much hell as we raise, um, DEP opponents, okay? They'll back down. And as much as we challenge them, they'll do their job better. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do believe that we, I don't think that there's any level that we're gonna uh, um, cede to them. You know, we're not going back down at any level, any permit, any, if they want to put up a fence and they want to go to the city for zoning, we're going to be right the hell there. So we have to fight them at every, every, every venue. So, um, but they are rubber stamper now and they will lie and they will collaborate with the polluters. And we've known that to be a fact. Um, but when we have challenged them, they back the hell down sometimes. Um, that's just my opinion. But um, I think that um, we'll, we'll give them not an inch of ground, DEP, Cobanta, the city, or anybody else. That's correct. And, that's um, what I meant. Already, <laughs> no, thank you for that, Celine. And there's already um, work being done toward preparing for contesting that air permit renewal. There are also waste permits that got renewed. I'm not sure the time frame on that one at the moment and there are other permits as well um, so we will put a fight up over that but dp is generally not the place where these battles are won i'll just put it that way um okay. where, i have a question thank you. yes let's hear your question we got through the others uh my question is uh have you considered uh an actual uh constitutional uh, attack based upon the the environmental uh, protection uh, provision of the Pennsylvania Constitution. Uh, uh, the people are entitled to clean air and clean water, and that that is a, a judicial, judicially, ju, ju, judicially just justiciable. Uh, uh, on, uh, the, the courts have held that, that cases can be brought just on that section of the Constitution alone, without a statute. Uh, uh, has anybody thought about hey, that? Mike, Mike, he's talking about Article 27, yeah. our right, our constitutional yeah. right to clean air, clean land, and clean water. Yes. Um, what we have done. Um, well, you go ahead, Michael. You answer that. Sure. So Article we talk one, about the cases. Sure. Um, so first Article of all, 1, Section 27. Yeah. Yeah. Article 1, Section 27 is part of the Pennsylvania Constitution, and it grants the people the right to clean air and pure water. And that right is something- In Pennsylvania. That, in Pennsylvania. And that right is something that not just the DEP and the state government, but county governments and municipal governments have a legal obligation to uphold. It is their duty to make sure that they are not causing any kind of harm to the air or water that would affect the people. Now, if you take this in the most literal sense, every air permit, every waste permit would have to be denied. And we would like to see most of that happen. But the courts are only gonna go so far, unfortunately. So even though in 2013, we saw a groundbreaking Pennsylvania Supreme Court case, where after decades of the court saying, no, you can't bring this to court. It's not something you can like actually sink your teeth into. It's just kind of window dressing. They said, okay, now it has teeth and they use it to strike down a state law that said that local governments can't regulate oil and gas. And since then, a number of lawsuits have been brought to try to use those teeth and apply in different situations. 
and some of them have gone better than others. But the courts, in what I've seen so far, are not going to go as far as saying every air permit or other pollution permit has to be denied because it's causing air pollution. That would make sense in terms of a literal reading of the Constitution, but that's not as far as the courts are willing to go. Um, so a lot of cases, well, when they do get brought, they incorporate that and it's an argument because it might help in some cases, but I don't think we're going to be able to rest just on that because the, the courts are not going to just take that as an argument. Um, no, it's but I, you, you need to go back further yeah, on circle we'll versus site. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that now. Um, so Chester is famous for having the first case of environmental racism, basically, under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's the Title VI, which obligates any recipient of federal funds to not take actions that have a discriminatory effect on racial minorities. In other words, if DEP gives out a permit to a polluter in Chester, as they did in 1995, I think it was, with this um, contaminated soil plant, soil remediation systems, and that was the fifth waste facility cited and permitted in Chester out of eight in the whole county. And so Chester residents sued the state Department of Environmental Protection. And this court case went in the federal courts all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And they were winning with the argument that they don't need to prove intentional discrimination, that the law says, the Civil Rights Act says, as long as there's a discriminatory effect, you can sue over this. And other federal courts were saying the same thing. Unfortunately, what happened in this case is that the state probably coordinated with the company, but the company uh, withdrew their permit and the Supreme Court said, oh, well, now it's moot and we're going to set aside that lower court ruling and make you start over. And so in Camden, people did start over and use the same argument against a polluter there and we're doing well again until a different a U.S. Supreme Court case came from Alabama, an English only case about a driver's license. And it said under the Civil Rights Act, you can sue over it, um, but you have to prove that's intentional. Because even though this other part of Title VI is still illegal to discriminate whether it's intentional or not, there is not the ability of private actors, of individuals, of organizations to sue the government unless they can prove intent. So it's still illegal. The government can sue itself over this, but that doesn't tend to happen. So all that's been possible since then is that people can yeah. complain to EPA. And ask <laughs> but EPA initially when, when Chester residents brought that suit forward, um, the initial uh, point of contention was that we didn't have standing. We didn't have a right to bring that lawsuit. And once we brought it and it was determined that we did have standing, um, that was a major victory for environmental justice groups. Um, so we have been trend centers, uh, 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 setters uh, from the beginning. Um, and we're just going to stay on this battlefield. Um, but that was the first uh, suit of its kind in the nation that came out of Chester, PA. And it was brought forth by Chester residents concerned for quality living and our named plaintiffs. And that's, that suit has been studied, I don't, I, I don't even know how many times, um, and cited many, many times. So, and we can come up with some other stuff. So we're just gonna keep on moving. <laughs> and um, <laughs> since I am, um, I don't wear this hat that often, but I am now an attorney and I don't use it very often, but I did write a law journal article on this. So if anyone wants to know about the case, about the other cases that flowed from it, some of the history of that, I'm dropping a link into the chat. Um, you're welcome to check that out. Um, okay, there's a question from Todd. Um, is there an eminent domain angle here? In other words, could Chester City or Delaware County declare a taking of the Cavanta plant in the name of public health? Now, for them to do that, they would have to have a public purpose for taking that land. I did see something similar come in DC where there was a long-standing controversy in the black community around trash transfer stations in their neighborhoods. And in recent years, one of the council members found a public purpose to basically um, take the land from under that trash transfer station, one of them. And they needed a place to store the city's um, sewage maintenance trucks 
And so um, empty ones, not full of sewage, thankfully. But um, they said, okay, we need the land for that. So we're going to take it away. And maybe I think they might have had to pay them for the value of that property um, in some amount, um, but that is allowed. Um, so the county or the city could do that um, if they were so bold, um, but there will be a cost um, to doing so. They would have to pay the, the value of that property. A great question. Is, is, I think is, it also happened in Manhattan somewhere, Michael. Yeah, this, this happens a lot in a lot of places. Unfortunately, a lot of it happens to build pipelines, which some of you may be familiar with, eminent domain being used to build um, oil and gas um, pipelines throughout Pennsylvania, including the one to Marcus Hall. Is this uh, incinerator making money? Is this a profitable enterprise? Yeah. Um, I believe it's the most profitable plant that this company has, although this industry in general, not so much. Um, they recently admitted um, with the new CEO of Cavanta to their shareholders that only a handful of their plants are really making them much money, that most of their profits are coming from a small number of their plants. They have about 41 incinerators in the US. Uh, well, US was a little bit elsewhere. And they're looking at shutting down some of the other ones. But this being their largest plant with the fewest controls on it has got to make it the most profitable in their fleet. So I think we're gonna see some others close, but this one they're gonna hold on to as long as they can. But so didn't we do possible. research and the margin of, of their uh, uh, profit was very small? I thought that came out of C4. Um, yeah, I don't recall Michael. the numbers of that. Yeah, I don't recall that, um, but I did just see today. But they weren't as profitable there. as we thought they were. Yeah. Yeah, they're... I don't, I don't have the figures issue. either. One of the indications of that is they just had an article that came out today um, in a presentation of their shareholders that came out this past week that was talking about possibly even selling off the company. And we know that their main competitor, Wheelbrader, just got sold or restructured for the third time in like the past seven years. So we know this industry is going through a lot of um, changes like that because they're aging and becoming less profitable. They can't compete against natural gas prices on the electric sales side. Um, so um, it's looking favorable in terms of seeing these plants shut down. It's just this is not the plant that we're going to see shut down um, for economic reasons soon. Okay, any other questions? Um, let's talk a bit because one of the big components and one of the big um, counterpoints and the foolishness Covanta just put out is that they generate electricity for the city. Um, I am not aware of one light bulb that they turn on from the electricity, the what 90 megawatts they make there going to the city of Chester. It is not used for households in Chester. So I don't want people to have that impression that, oh my God, they, 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 they power the city. They do not. Everybody in Chester I know gets a Pico bill. So I just wanted to address that. Uh, initially, when they started, they would sell the electricity over to Atlantic City. Right now, I believe it's going to some industrial uses. We haven't been able to track down yet as to who exactly they're selling this electricity to. It wouldn't shock me if half of it is going to the soccer stadium since they have such a cozy... Um, relationship with them now. So I'm not sure where their electricity is going, but I can assure people on the call, it doesn't power one street light in the city of Chester or one household in the city of Chester. Yeah, they, we're in so a there would be no grid. There. Yeah, we're in a regional grid called PJM, which is Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, but also DC, Delaware, and bits and pieces of states as far as North Carolina and Illinois. And so they are one tiny, tiny drop in this big pool of electricity. So when they sell electricity, it's going into this big grid. And if they shut down tomorrow, just like their almost as large, uh, almost as large plant did um, when they had that fire in Northern Virginia, and they shut down immediately, um, the power didn't go out anywhere. They're part of a big regional grid and it'll flow from other facilities. Um, so the 90 megawatts they make is, is a drop in the bucket. A typical um, natural gas power plant 
is about 670 megawatts, um, just to give you a sense of size of um, how much the biggest incinerator in the country is compared to a typical gas plant. So 90 versus yeah. 670, it's not even close. Yeah, but that's part of their new PR uh, program um, that they put out and saying, it, it, the letter that they sent to the residents claiming that they power homes in um, <laughs> the city of Chester, which is a lie. Well, you have statistics, don't you, about the the uh, pollutant pollution per kilowatt of electricity that they produce. I mean, uh, how how does does this rank in in connection with a coal fired power plant? Um, that that is something we compared, and we know that they're far dirtier than coal by almost every pollutant you can measure. Um, if you go to this page on the incineration page, we have you'll see there's a section, um, well, right at the top, there's a report um, that I put out back in March about Cavanta in Maryland. And there's, there's a lengthy report that gets into a lot of pieces. One of those, um, there's a section just on their emissions per kilowatt hour, including the New York study that their state environmental agency did. So there's a whole page of just data from that agency. So it's not me making it up, it's a government agency in New York showing that incineration is far dirtier than coal on all but one of the pollutants that they measured. Um, mercury is 14 times worse per unit of energy. Oh, so it's very significant. And um, you'll find other data on that webpage if you look at the um, section about how it compares to coal plants. Um, there's a whole page on, on the data on that one. Uh, you're, gonna yeah, send but, out, you're gonna send out these PowerPoint things to us? Yeah, I'll share the PowerPoint to everyone here and um, the links in there and, and also on that incineration page you can explore. And Mike, I wanted to uh, address uh, one issue. Um, we talked about Chester getting the pollution first. There are some pollutants that we get first, but we also know because of the height of the stack and when the pollution comes out of the stack that it's heated there are actually some pollution, uh, uh, pollutants that may actually go up and over the city of Chester and fall on Delaware County at a higher rate than Chester. Um, I'm not sure what they are, um, but that is one of the points that we were taught by the EPA. Um, I, I can't rattle them off, but I know I don't know if it's heavy metals or what exactly it is. I think we need to really look into that yeah. and see what pollutants are lighter than other ones and yeah. their fallout distance. Yeah, there's some that I do um, know about. Um, I, I can't say I know about most of them, but I know that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is a mouthful, but they call them PAHs. These are like, if you look at a soccer ball, it kind of looks like that because you have all these like linked hexagons of benzene, like all kinds of ways of um, linking them up. And you've heard of one of these chemicals probably, and that's in cigarette smoking. They talk about benzoapyrene, and that's one of these PAH chemicals. They're known to cause cancer in animals and almost certainly also in humans. And these are pretty heavy, so they drop more locally. Uh, we know that a lot of this also came out of Kimberly Clark's um, waste coal burner when they were burning waste coal for many years. They were infamous for putting a lot of that pollutant out. So Chester's getting hit from multiple sources uh, with a pollutant like that. And then some are lighter and travel further like dioxins, the most toxic chemicals known to science, gravitate to the poles and go as far as the Canadian Arctic, 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 Arctic and climb up the climb food up chain. The and most of your exposure actually is from eating meat and dairy. So if you're not vegetarian or vegan, you're getting a much higher dose than, than some of the rest of us. Um, but that is not from breathing, it's from eating meat and dairy because that's where that concentrates, just like mercury will concentrate in fish once it hits the water. So, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. so what's the way forward? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> there's, no, there's no legal, you're, you're going to contest the renewal of the permits, but but that uh, doesn't seem like a very effective strategy. Yeah, uh, that's definitely not our number one strategy. It's one of the strategies, but it's not the, the main one. Um, <laughs> so, go ahead, Jim. There, There is no magic bullet, okay? There is no microwavable answer. It, this is hard work. It's dirty work. It's laborious. It's time-consuming. But I think that we are all worth it. Uh, I think that the way you beat them is is through collaboration. 
The problem that we have in Chester is the problem that you all have in Delaware County. This is not an isolated battle in Chester. Y'all don't have a separate air pipe and neither do we. So the air that is generated in Chester eventually will seep into Delaware County and for other parts. Sure. So it has to be a united front. It has to be a consolidated army, such as what we're doing with the zero waste with people in Delaware County and Chester and, 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 and New York and Ocean City, Maryland and Philly, linking together and standing up and holding these bums accountable. And, and you got to do it from the dog catcher to the mayor to DEP, to EPA, nobody is immune for accountability for this issue. Nobody. They've all hid under their titles. Oh, well, <laughs> we're the EPA and, and we don't have any regulatory. Oh, yeah, you do. You're in business for a reason. The DEP, you, yes, you are accountable to people. Yes, you are. The mayor. Oh, you definitely accountable, but we're going to, we're going to do your ass about a year. Okay. You're going to be up out of there. You and the other four idiots. I have to go. Well, Sorry. Three. Bye-bye. But that's how we beat them. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I, it's I, been a great talk. Hi, thank you so much. This is Robin. Um, I just really quick question. Is there anything else we should know about Mayor Kirkland? No, I'm just I'm just stuck because I I've done some. Did he get money from? Did he get money from Covanta? Uh, do did we they, have did, it on did tape? Donate to his? Did they donate to his campaign? Oh, well, absolutely. That's something that's being researched. Excuse oh, me, Mayor. God. Mayor, my name my name is Robin. Excuse me, Mayor. This is Robin. this is the cream de cream. Hi, Robin. Hi, Robin. And, yeah, I was, I was just curious. Um, you were you this were silent we during this this presentation. I just got on. I'm sorry, Robin. I just got on. Oh, yeah, okay, because yeah, I, I just wanted to know what yes, your Mr. thoughts Rivers. are, um, just in terms of the amount of damage that um, that the incinerator has caused in the area. So, just from my research, I okay. I just want to know what your thoughts are about that. Let me talk. To, let me let me explain to you my question. And before it, we even got to Cabana, there was Westinghouse, and there was American Refuge. That's what folks don't talk about. Westinghouse and American Refuge. Both of them were renters of the property. When Cavanta came aboard, Cavanta bought the property, cleaned the property up, has been working very closely with DEP and EPA. They have been working very closely with the community. When I was fighting against Westinghouse and American Refuge, they were disrespecting, disregarding, and providing harmful uh, things into the air of the city of Chester. Now, if we're going to talk about what harmful uh, industries are on or in the city of Chester, then we need to, I want to go across the board and let's talk about all of them. Let's see what, who's breaking the law, who's not breaking the law, who's putting pollutants in the air, who's not putting pollutants in the air, who's, who, who is benefiting the community, who's not benefiting the community. I want to talk about the whole thing. I would be more than glad with anybody to say, let's do this. Let's go down. Let's do a tour of Cavanta. Let's do a tour of Delcora. I challenge anyone that wants to go down and let's say, let's tour these facilities. Well, Mayor, the only problem is that with the presentation, it's unfortunate you just missed it mm -hmm. because apparently um, Covanta has mm -hmm. uh, an extensive amount of pollution that extends beyond uh, Delcora. Um, they have a number of violations just in terms of the pollutants they've put out um, into the community. Um, and I think that there have been opportunities for you to talk with with some of the community go. activists. And well, I think the concern is that that you haven't you haven't done that. Well I don't consider them community activists. When you when you're not in my community and you call yourself a community activist, I don't consider that community activist. I consider those persons that who live here and work here and really concerned about what's going on here and are actively involved in the community actively involved in the community, raising their children in the community. 
I believe that those are the real community activists. I have addressed this issue and other issues such as this down through the years. Kavanta, if you if you look at who's really being fine, if you check out the last time Kavanta has been fine, check out the last time Delcor has been fine, check out the last time um, some of our other industries have been. Kavanta fine. just got violations last month, Mayor. Just saying. So you know. Excuse me. Seven of them last month, Kavanta. Excuse me? Kavanta was just fined for seven violations by DEP last month, May 5th. Well, we, we, we get every violation, we get every violation from DEP of any industry that is in violation because if they're in violation, the city gets the money. So I, the city gets money for them. You're shaking your head. See, that's what I mean when people don't want to hear well, the if truth. it were true, I, I agree with you, but no, I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, well, well they, they are true. They are true. Every time, every time an industry is in violation with DEP or EPA, they, the money, portion of that money that they have to send to them comes to the city each and every time. That's a fact. From part of the, the PowerPoint presentation um, that Covanta, you said, is a, is a good community partner, but I think they only employ a fraction of residents in the area. It's very small, and a lot of the people who actually work there don't even live in the community. So that's just one example of not being a good community partner. So it's just a matter of clarification. I'm just trying to get a, a good understanding. I'm glad you're here because I just want to understand where, you know, what your position is. My position is this. There was, before Cavanta, there was Westinghouse, and then there was American Refuge. Two industries that were highly, but there were pollutants, there were great pollutants in our community. And I stood and I fought against them. Because the matter is, we have kids right now, we have the seniors right now that is currently having very ha bad health issues, and we need to figure out a way to how we can be able to get this situated for them. There mm -hmm. were times that you have fought on the incinerator at that period of time when you spoke out and said that. My mm -hmm. issue is, my concern is, what can we do now? The same way you put out that fight then that you always speak on, oh, back then when they came, I did this, it's still an issue. So, so how can we be able to change it? What it's are you going to do now so we can no. get this in order? I'll, I'll be here for a half hour. What we I'm gonna do what I what I committed myself. Right, I, I gotta pay attention. It's five. What I've committed myself to do, to doing is what I said before. I, I will put together my very own environmental board or commission that will study all of the waterfront properties or all the industries that are here in the city, and we're going to find out from the industries as well as our community leaders, what the problems are, what the issues are, how they're working to solve them, and what we need to do as a community to make things better. Thank That's you for what that, but what, I, but what I would like to know is why can't we by now, or even now, find a way to even collaborate? Why do we have to be a separate thing? Because this fight has been going on for 30 years even plus. So why is it that we have to now say, oh, let's find a new individual? Half of the people, half of the residents that you may form are individuals that are not even out there right now with the, the, the organization. And I'm not just saying with Circle, I'm talking about different organizations that have been out here collaborating to find because a way that we can make a fight for everybody. So why not come together and collaborate now if you're saying that you're the mayor, you want to really figure out things, we're out here trying to figure it out. So how can we be able to come together and do that then separating it? Because there are certain people who have made it a political issue, not a, not a community issue. It's obvious what it is. And so I'm not going to get involved with those individuals or, or, or allow myself to uh, uh, get, allow myself to be, pulled into something political when I know that there's some serious issues out here in our community, other even other than an environmental, uh, environmental issues. There's a lot on our plate. And I'm not going to allow myself or allow anybody else to politicize one thing and try to drive that. If, if that's what other persons want to do, let them do that. 
then I'll and then I, there's there are other things on the plate. There are other agendas that need to be taken care of, and that is exactly what we will do. Okay, uh, I'm still trying to figure. Uh, even if that is the case, well, the people politics is the reason why we're we're at where we at now. That that's the problem. Even if we wanted to tear away from politics, everything that has to do with the policies, the way things are being ran in our municipalities, I'm going to say Chester. It's all evolving behind legislation, which equals back to politics. Cabana's here because of what? Politics. They had to go to a uh, official. When you're sitting in, in the seat, you're now in a politics. So it's always going to reference that. I do follow the whole aspect of community, but it's the community right now. Trying to get Prevailing winds are from west to east. And uh, most of the, of the fumes on that stack ought to be going over New Jersey. And I never heard that mentioned. That's true. Yeah, the um, closest monitoring data is thing from is from the airport, so that's pretty close. And um, most of the winds, yeah, blow it into New Jersey. Some blow it up into Philadelphia. A good chunk of it does hit the Philly area, and some of it, of course, is going to swing back and hit the rest of Delaware County. So no one's really immune. Yeah, but I'm surprised there's not more of an interstate uh, uh, interstate issue. Well, there are two trash incinerators on the New Jersey side, one in Camden that we're busy fighting. That's also Cavanta, biggest air polluter in Camden County, and one in Gloucester, even closer to Chester. Um, and New Jersey is Cavanta's home state. I don't think that um, politically, with all the industry that they have, they're going to start picking on Cavanta in Pennsylvania because they would have to um, look a little closer to home if they did. Uh, but we've got fights going on both sides of the river. Um, they're working together where need be, and um, we're going to see this as one big puzzle that we're taking on. And, and, and uh, Michael will have that uh, uh, documentation. All of it is on Energy Justice Network. Um, if you, if it's something that you don't understand because it, his 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 website is extensive, but it'll make your head hurt. But the data is there. Um, he will respond to you in explaining anything. He's very good at um, the technical reviews and digging out numbers and um, everything that we have put out or we publish is triple checked by him and everybody else. So we make sure that our information is accurate because we will be attacked. Um, personally and professionally, um, but the facts are the facts. Um, they are a big polluter. They impact um, all of Delco County, um, Chester, particularly uh, all the residents of Chester. And at this point, all we are trying to do is give our citizens a, a chance to live um, a better quality of life. We shouldn't have people that don't have the ability to open up their windows um, or can't walk to their car without breathing. So that's why we do what we do, um, to give us a chance to live. And not only live, but not live dragging an oxygen tank, but having a good quality of life.